question, just to make sure I'm talking to the right crowd. Because, you know, sometimes I put these messages together and maybe it's just for me. I don't think so. Is there anything in your life that you need to trust God for? Anything kind of impossible going on? Anything painful, struggling, just come on, God. Don't talk to God like that, by the way. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to pause from our study through the book of 2 Corinthians. A week ago yesterday, I shared a message at the monthly men's breakfast, and Pastor Randy talked to the board, and they agreed that I should share this message with the whole church. So they believe that we all need to hear this. Um, I know that I need to hear it again, so uh, it's probably important for all of us. Today we're going to talk about trust, specifically about trusting God. Now, if you talk to Christians, most Christians, if you ask them, do you trust God, you would get an almost universal what? Yeah, yeah of course I do, pastor. Dumb question. The problem is, if you look at their lives, it doesn't look like they're trusting God. There's stuff going on in their lives that seems to indicate something other than trusting God. And so what, what this message is about is trying to help us to understand what is it what does it really mean when you are trusting God? Because if we, if we say we're trusting God and even believe we're trusting God and yet we're not trusting God, that's going to show up in the way that we live our lives. And it's going to cost us something in our life that we, that we, we shouldn't have to let, we shouldn't have to pay. We should be able to truly trust God. And there's a, there's a result that comes from truly trusting God that we all desperately need and desire and want and are looking for in our lives. We've been looking at this letter from the Apostle Paul, and Paul was a man who was well acquainted with difficult things going on in his life, right? We know that, right? Even from a casual look at Paul's life, we know that. Well, he talked about it a couple of times here in chapter 11, starting in verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors, more abundant. I mean, I work harder than the rest of them. In stripes, I mean, getting a beating above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, more often, meaning being exposed to life-threatening situations. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one, meaning, meaning scourged. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, maybe to death, and he was raised to life in, I'm um, sorry, I lost my place. Um, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and day I have been in a deep and journeys often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the cities, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Somebody say, thank God I'm not Paul. I mean, I mean most of us have not endured a, a fraction of those things. And those, listen church, are just the things he experienced in his service to the Lord. He had other things going on in his life too. We know of a there was a physical ailment that he had. And, 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 it, and it interfered. He had, he had difficult things happening in his life. Turn to 
chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians. At the beginning of this letter, he spoke about the effect that all of this had upon him. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Things were so hard for him, them, him and them that they were concerned that they might die as a result of it. It would cost them their very life to minister to Christ. Verse 9. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and he does deliver us, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Even with all that terrible stuff that was going on in Paul's life, he trusted God. In fact, he says elsewhere that these things taught him to trust God. Paul was remarkable. There is no other way around it. You look at Paul's life, that guy was a rock star. And he wasn't special. He was a guy. He was following, he was giving us an example. But the example was not his. He said also, or in the previous letter that he wrote to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Paul could look at Christ's life and say, this is how we trust God. And we can look at Christ's life, we can look at Paul's life and see examples of what it means to trust God. So that's my goal this morning, is to help us to better understand what it means to trust God. Because if we don't, we are making our life harder than it needs to be. We can make our life better simply by trusting God. Simply. It's simple, but it's not easy. We'll get into that in a minute. God, I mean, if you look at Paul's life, can you say that Paul's life was remarkable? That God worked powerfully through Paul? Amazing things. I mean, he, 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 he changed the world. A whole region of the world was impacted by this man and the people that were with him and ministered with him. Because he trusted God. And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. God can work powerfully through you through your life. You are, Paul was no more special than you. The same God that was in Paul is in you. And if you will trust God, the power of God will manifest out of your life in the same ways that it did in Paul. Not the same ways, but in, in the same manner in which it did in him. It came out because he trusted God. Trust him in, his, in your life. Power, amazing power will show up in your life, in your marriage. You want, you, anybody want the power of God to show up in their marriage? Say, so I, I do, got my hand up. In my family? Oh, please, Jesus. Your health, your finances, your career, pick something you want the power of God to show up in. If you want the power of God to show up in something in your life, you need to trust him in that area. And whether or not his power shows up in our lives is going to come down to that one thing. Do you really trust God? And I'm going to challenge you today, so get ready. That many of us are saying we trust God, but we're not. Not really. And we need to, so that we can experience the power. And there's more than just power that comes with that. Something that's glorious, something we all should desire. Let's pray, and then we'll get into our our message for today. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this day. And Lord, um, Lord, as I was asking if uh, they had anything that they need to trust you for, Lord God, I, I mean, you know my life. And there are big things that we're trusting you for. 
Lord, trying to trust you for. And we're not always doing it right. And so, Lord, as, as I prepare to share this message, Lord, I, I'm going to pray selfishly right now for myself, for my wife, for my family. Lord God, that you would open up our hearts to hear what you would say to us personally. But Lord, I, I know that, Lord, this message is not, not just for us, but it's for the whole church. And for anyone who might stumble across this at any point, I pray, Lord, for their hearts to be open to your spirit as we get into this just absolutely vital topic that we understand just what it means to truly trust you. So we give this time to you, we give this day to you, and we give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this morning's message is Trusting Faith. Start with a definition of the word trust. That's always a good idea. The definition is, right out of the dictionary, belief in and reliance on the integrity, strength, ability, surety, etc. of a person or thing, confident expectation of something, hope. Now, we can replace person or thing with what? God and his word. That, that, that God has given us himself and his word, and they are they can be trusted. You're probably familiar with the verse, verses, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Some of you could probably quote that to me. You trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Over the years, I have counseled many people, and it's not uncommon that at some point in the conversation that I'm encouraging them to trust God in something or some way, or you know, it's just, it's just part of the process because I believe it's kind of one of those important things. You know, when we're going through something, often they're in my office because there's something, there's something they can't fix, something they can't control, and they need to trust God in that thing. And, and invariably, somebody will also respond saying, but I do trust God. Really? And what it proves to me as I look into their lives that what they're saying is that they, they believe they trust God, but there's something about it that they just don't get, something they don't understand about trusting God. They're missing something. And then it's my job to help them try to find it. There's a disconnect with what they think trusting God looks like and what it actually is. Who's familiar with the team building exercise, the trust fall? Anybody heard of the trust fall? It's very common if you ever get involved in any team building conferences or seminars and things where they'll, the idea is that you've got a person who's standing and they close their eyes and cross their hands. They got a couple of people behind them and they just fall back. And, and their expectation is that the people behind them are going to do what? Catch them. They are trusting the people behind them, their team, to catch them. Have you ever seen one of those? You know, if you get onto YouTube, you know, some of the ones that, you know, the trust fall fails, you know, they just don't, don't look at those ones. They make me sad. Two things are going on in a trust fall is the person that's doing it believes that the people are able to catch them and willing to catch them. Before someone will do a trust fall, they have to believe those two things, that they, the people are able and willing to catch them, right? Because who would do a trust fall if those two things weren't true? And they're relying on them. How do you know they're relying on them to do that? They fall. They just let go and fall. That's how you know they believe what they're saying. Right? Does that make sense so far? You guys following me? Trusting God works the same way. It's the same kind of mechanics there. The same pieces are present in, in trusting God as in that. It begins with faith. It begins with what we believe. 
Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Listen, what you believe about God is what you can trust him for, right? Does that not make sense? That, that if, you, if you don't believe something about God, then you're not going to trust him for that thing. But if you do believe it, if you truly believe something about God, that God, if I lean back, you're going to catch me. If I truly believe that, what will I do? I'm, fall, I'm going. I'm letting go. And I won't try to catch myself. What do you believe that God can do in your life? What can God do in your circumstance? What can God do with this world around us? If your answer is anything less than absolutely anything, God can do anything, then you have a problem with faith. Because the God that I believe in created the world, the universe, all created things with a word. The God that I believe in holds the entire existence, created universe in the palm of his hand and controls it. He is sovereign over everything. And if you believe that there is absolutely anything that is outside of that control, you have a problem with faith. There is nothing God can't do. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Nothing he can't do. Jesus said in Luke 18, 27, the things which are impossible with men, which those would be all your issues, all your struggles, all your junk, are possible with God. Is that true? Really? Do you believe it? Prove it. Prove it. Because if it's true, and you believe it, then you should prove it, right? I mean, I mean am, I, am, I, am I getting too hard here? Am I being too mean? Sometimes I, am, sometimes I am. If I were to ask a couple of you to come up here, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I don't want to see it on YouTube. No. But if I were to ask you to come up here and, and, and to catch me in a trust fall, if you told me that you were able and willing, I would do it. Now, if my four-year-old granddaughter brought her two-year-old brother up and said, Papa, we want to do a trust fall with you. But why wouldn't I do it? They're willing, they may be willing, but they're not able. They're not able. So it's not that I don't trust them, right? They just aren't able. Listen, God's word is filled with his promises to catch us. Did you know that? Filled, cover to cover, promise, hundreds of them, of God's promises to catch us. Promise after promise after promise. And the question we have to ask ourselves, are they true? And if they're true, the quest, next question we have is, do we believe that? And are, am I willing to prove it? Does my life prove that they are true and that I believe that they are true? Isaiah 58, 9. Here's a promise. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. Is that true? Is it? Do you believe it? Prove it. Can you prove it with your life? How about this one? Deuteronomy 31.8. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Is that one true? Yeah. Do you believe? Do you believe it's true? And if so, can you prove it? 
Does your life prove that you believe that that verse is true? One last one. I could do this all day. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is in heaven right now preparing a place for you. Do you believe, is it true that he's doing that and that someday he's going to come back and get you? Is that true? Do you believe it? Does your life prove it? There's so many more, so many more of these verses. Listen, here, here's one of the realities of trusting God. You cannot trust a God you do not know. If you don't know God, if you don't know what he's promised you, if you don't know what he said, you can't trust him. Because you don't know how. You don't know what to trust him for. That's why guys like me are always up here banging on you. Read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. Why? Because God's trying to talk to you. He's trying to give you things that you can trust in him so that it will transform your life, change you, and make your life the way it's supposed to be. You cannot know God apart from his word. You cannot trust a God that you do not know. So the very first step, step to trusting God is getting to know him better. If you're struggling in some area of trusting God, you've got to press in to knowing him better in that area, whatever it is. Read the Bible. Get into a life group. There's several going on throughout the week. Listen or watch the word of God being taught on a regular basis. God's word tells us what God promised to do, how he promised to catch us if we will trust him. And he repeatedly tells us that he is able to do whatever he promises. Do you believe that God is able the answer has to be yes. Anything less than yes is a problem of faith. Okay, if that's all true, then why do we struggle to trust him? Why can't we just trust God? For most, it's not that God is able. Most people would say, yes, there's nothing that God can't do. God can do anything. No limit. For some, the question is whether or not God is willing to act on their behalf. Not that God won't or that he can, but if he's willing. The leper in Luke chapter 5 said this, and it happened when he was in a certain city that behold, a man was full of leprosy, saw Jesus, and he fell down on his face and implored him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Let me ask you a question. Did this leper believe that Jesus was able to heal him? Yes, that's obvious. What was his, what, where was he doubting that whether or not Jesus was willing to heal him? If you are willing, we got to put ourselves in this leper's place. It says he was full of lepers. You know what I mean? He had been a leper for a long time. And you know how the world treated lepers back then? They're outcast, rejected by everyone else around them, driven from society. All this man knew was, was human rejection and disappointment, isolation from the people of God so that he, didn't even, he wasn't able even to, to relate to God the way that others around him. And all this did for him was bring him to this place where that's how he treated God. God's going to treat me the same way that all they do, all of them do. He took all of his personal experiences and translated them into his relationship with God. And we do exactly the same thing. We, we look at the way people treat us and we assume, we presume that that's how God's going to treat us. If people reject me, God's going to reject me. If people disappoint me, then God's going to disappoint me. We don't do it deliberately. We don't do it intentionally. We aren't thinking about doing it, but that's exactly what we're doing often. This leper was looking at Jesus saying, okay, I know you can do it because you've done it with others. 
But just the way everybody else, everybody else has treated me, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to reject me. You're going to drive me away. You don't want any part of me. We take our experiences from the past and then we project them onto our relationship with God. How can you trust a God who's just like everybody else? And that's what we often do. What was Jesus' response to the leper? I am willing. I love that. I am willing. Trusting God. First, take God at his word. Take God at his word. Know what his word says and believe it at face value. Don't interpret it by your experience. Don't interpret it by the way other people are acting or behaving or even what they tell you. Know what God's word says and take it at face value, especially in the promises. When he promises you something, just believe them. You don't have to understand them. You don't have to be able to, you know, exposit them, you know, using the Greek or the Hebrew. Just believe. Believe that he can. Believe that he can catch you if you'll just trust him. And then second, you have to believe that he is willing to act on your behalf. God will catch you if you will trust him. Catch that? If you will trust him. Amen. Third part may be the hardest part. If we believe that God can and believe that he's willing, what will we do? We will lean back and fall. We'll do something. The trust fall exercise is pretty pointless if the person doing the trust fall doesn't lean back and fall into the arms behind him, right? It really isn't an exercise at that point. Just people standing around doing nothing. There are two aspects of the trust fall that are important to us because it relates so well to what it is that we typically are facing when we're dealing with these kinds of trusting God issues. In the trust fall, the person doing the trust fall is helpless and blind. If they're doing it the way that it's designed, they can't save themselves. They can't help themselves. Once they go, they're going. And they cannot see how it's going to end. That's the whole point of a trust fall. Not being able to see how it's going to end. The only time you need to trust God is when you are helpless to catch yourself helpless to solve your problem, helpless to deal with your issue, and you're blind to how it's going to turn out. You have no idea how it's going to turn out. A couple of weeks ago, our then three-week-old great-grandson, Hendrix, ended up in the hospital, rushed to the hospital, and ended up getting a spinal tap. And they had no idea what was going on. Well, Kelly and I are 3,000 miles away. How helpful can we be from 3,000 miles away? What can we do about it? We're absolutely helpless. And we're blind to how it's going to turn out. We had no idea. Matter of fact, we weren't getting a ton of information. He's in the, he's in the hospital. He's getting a spinal tap. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. What's going on? Chirp, chirp, chirp. We needed to trust God. Right around the same time, I'll say coincidentally, just because it's the only word that really works right there, my four-year-old granddaughter did something we told her at least a hundred times not to do. Do not play with doors. Why? You'll smash your finger. Guess what she did? She smashed her finger. That was a mess. You know what? I knew what to do. I kind of knew how, I kind of had an idea how it was going to turn out. See, there are things coming to our lives. The thing with Hendrix, we needed to trust God. 
because we were helpless and blind. I didn't really need to trust God with Aurora. Aurora. I took her in, cleaned it up, and basically she ends up now, if you see her running around the church, she's got a little splint on her finger, more for, you know, cosmetics, really, because it makes her happy to have that splint on her finger than for anything else. How do we trust God? How would we trust God in the case of Hendrix? We're helpless and blind. Well, I start by what I believe. What do I believe about God? Well, can God heal Hendrix? Yes. I absolutely believe that God could heal Hendrix. Miraculously, supernaturally, he could do that. I also know that he, you know, kind of created and ordained doctors for the purpose of bringing healing to our physical bodies. So he could do it that way too. So I believe that God can heal. I also believe that God is willing to do that. God, you, I know you are willing to do that. And then I choose what my next actions are. Once I, once I, once I remind myself what I believe, then I have to, I have to make some confessions. First, I confess that I am helpless to do anything about it. I am not able, God. I am not able to do anything about this. Only you are. Only God is. Second, I remind myself that I cannot see how it's going to end. I don't know how it's going to turn out. And you know, it was pretty scary in the moment. And they were saying some scary things at the time. And this, this is where trusting God really starts to work. You see, we have this habit. We see a situation like that. What is the possible outcome? And we start imagining what the outcome is. And when we look at that outcome out there, and, you know, with a three-week-old, you know, Premature, he was premature by what, two months? Or a few weeks, anyways. He was one of a twin, so he was small when he came out. So, you know, a, a, a little baby, spinal tap, stuff going on. They're not sure, you know, what's the, you know, we, we get all the way into dark places. And we start to meditate on those. What was going to happen with Hendrix? D did we actually know? No, we didn't know. We didn't know what was going to happen. I knew what was going to happen with Aurora. Her fingernail was going to fall off. I I'm absolutely certain of that. Eventually, that thing's going to fall right off. With Hendrix, we didn't know. We were blind to the outcome. Here, here's one of the keys in this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll get to that eventually, Paul tells us that we have everything we need to take every thought into captivity. Did you know that? That there's not one thought that comes into your mind that you don't have exactly what you need to take that thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. To make that thought pleasing to God. You have everything you need to make every thought that you ever think pleasing to God. Now, now, does anybody actually do that? Probably not. But we ought to be careful with some of these thoughts that we allow in our minds. And we meditate on them, we fixate on them, and we project ahead an outcome that we have no control over and very likely isn't even going to happen but then we live our life as though it is going to happen. And it instills within us fear or anger or frustration or resentment or who knows what, depending on what your circumstance is. When you find yourself in one of these circumstances where you need to trust God, first remind yourself that God is able. God can catch you, whatever it is. There is nothing in your life that God can't fix, right? 
Somebody say, yes, I believe that. There's nothing. Nothing. And then, remind yourself that he is willing. We, we've had an kind of an example of this recently. Um, Kelly's mom, Pat, some of you have met her. And it's been, she's been struggling. She has pneumonia. And, uh, and they had a really hard time getting an IV into her. Like several days, I mean three or four days, they were trying to get an IV into her. And, and you know, she needed it. And so, they, well, you know, what can we do about that? <laughs> you know, we, don't, we can't do anything about that. Just trust God and trust the doctors. They were bringing in special equipment and special people. They, had all, they were just like one thing after another trying to get an IV into her. We must remember that God can, even when we can't, even when the doctors can't, even when the, 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 no, one, no one seems to have any idea how to do what needs to be done. God can. We have to believe it. And then we need to remind ourselves that God is willing. He's willing to act on your behalf. In Romans 8, 32, it says this. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us, say it with me, all things. All things. Freely give us all things. What is God willing to do in your life? All things. Do you think maybe he's willing to do those hard things in your life? Those things that really make you miserable, do you think he's willing to do those things? You have to believe it. All things is all things. No matter what, however you interpret that, it's all things. Listen, if you are in Christ, there is no reason for God to deny you anything. None. Now, now God is sovereign. And that means he determines what he does or doesn't do. He determines what, what happens or doesn't happen. He, everything in it, everything that goes on in our lives, he is sovereign in those things. And, and you know, we got to understand that sometimes he will or won't do certain things because but that's not, they're not because of us. He's not going to do it because of something in you. The reason why he does or doesn't do anything is found completely and totally in him. You aren't going to do something that makes God not willing to keep that verse. That verse is true. When is that verse true? Always. He is always prepared to freely give you all things. Third, remind yourself that you are helpless and blind. Only God is able, and only God can see the outcome. And then finally, after we've done all of that, we ask God what he wants us to do. God, what do you want us to do? In the case of Hendricks, all we could do is pray and invite others to pray with us. That's all we are able to do. And here's the key. I believe that we can answer this question for ourselves. That we can answer the question, am I trusting God in any circumstance? Anytime you come to a circumstance, you have a situation going on in your life, and you want to ask yourself the question, am I trusting God or not in this situation? The Bible tells us that we can know. We can absolutely examine ourselves. In Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4, says this, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. Listen, in your circumstance, in your situation, in that impossible thing, are you at peace about it? And if you're not at peace, it's an issue of trust. And that issue of trust goes back to an issue of faith. 
Now, that doesn't mean it makes everything easy. It doesn't. But it makes it possible. If we are truly trusting God, then we'll have peace about whatever that thing is because we believe that God can. We believe that he's able. We believe that he's willing. And that he has a plan. And the result of that peace is the power of God. If we will trust God, he will, he will keep us. Understand that something. It's not something you work up. He does it. He gives you his peace. Jesus said that too. I, hey, I, I give you my peace. But when we have to trust him first to get it. And then the result of that is the power of God coming out of our lives. God is worthy of trust. In everything and about everything. There's nothing in your life that you can't trust God for. He's able and willing to catch you. And we have to believe that and just fall back into his loving, powerful arms. Now, that doesn't mean everything is going to turn out the way you want them to. I, I, I would not even begin to promise something like that because the Bible doesn't promise it. But what, I, what I can tell you is when you learn to trust God, one of the other benefits of trust, truly trusting God is you accept anything that comes from His hand. Anything that happens, you accept because you trust the God who allowed it into your life. Yeah, I've shared stuff from my own life and you know a message like this it's not always easy because the, you know how God teaches us to trust him <laughs> by bringing things into our lives you know I'm the pastor of the church of course I know how to trust God I am I am the expert at trusting God God says, oh yeah? <laughs> so I stand up here preaching to myself. Because I don't, I don't share everything that's going on in my life up here. That's not, that's not any of your business, everything that's going on in my life. But you know what? There's stuff I've got right now that are so far beyond us that we have to trust him. And you know what? It's not always easy. Sometimes we, have to, we, have, we need help. And I'm thankful that I've got a group of people around me that helps. I've got people that love me. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand something. That trusting God is, is everything. It's everything. If you're not trusting God with every bit of your life, and, and no one is, by the way. No one is trusting Him absolutely with absolutely everything in their lives. Because God will, you know, you're not perfect yet. So he's going to bring something in your life to prove to you you're not perfect. And you know what? You need to trust him in that thing. So when it happens, we just have to remind ourselves over and over and over again, okay, if I'm not trusting God in this thing, because I, I know I'm not trusting him because I don't have peace, the kind of peace that surpasses understanding. I don't have the peace that just, just keeps me calm in, my, in all of my circumstances. If I don't have that peace, like that peace of just, a, have you ever been on a, on, a, on a perfectly calm body of water? It's a, it is a glorious experience. If you've never, and if you're not feeling that, if it's, if it's storms and waves and wind and noise, God's word to you, just trust me. Remember the disciples, they're with Jesus in the boat. He's sleeping. Storm's raging. They're freaking out. What does Jesus say to them? Where's your faith? Trust me. God has you. 
He's never going to let you go. He's never going to forsake you. He's always with you. He is able to do anything and everything if you will trust him. And if you don't know how, you're, you're in a church that loves to help. Turn to someone. Let them help. Because God wants to do something radical in us, each of us, every one of us. He created us to be the object of his love and the conduit of his power. And that power flows when we trust him in every bit of our lives. Because, you know, it's in those things that we're trusting God for, those really hard things in life, whereas we're trusting him, the world looks at us and says, how is that even possible? Trust him. Trust him with your whole life because he loves you so much and he's promised you so much and he's proven it by sending his son. If he sent his son for you, what won't he do for you? Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we come. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, your love. We thank you, Lord God, that we can trust you. But Lord, we're human. We're frail. We're weak. Sometimes we, we lose sight of the reality of who you are and what you've promised us. As so we come to a day like today, and, and I know I'm not, I'm not preaching just to myself or to my family. I know that many of us have things, impossible things, hard things, Yet if we'll just still our hearts, take our eyes off of those things, even for a moment. And as that verse in Isaiah says, to, to fix our eyes on you, and that our eyes will be stayed on you, focused on you, and we remind ourselves that, God, you are able. You can catch us. And that you are willing to do that. And you proved it by sending your son to die for us while we were, while we hated you, while we were aliens from you, you sent your son for us. There's nothing you will deny us. It will just trust you. I thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. I thank you for all that you've done in our lives. And Lord, we do lift up the issues of our life and recognize that that many of these things we are helpless and blind. Lord, help us to, to remind ourselves that we are helpless, but you are not. That we are blind to how it's going to turn out. And we need to come to the God of the, of the future, the God that, that owns the future, that lives in the future, that controls the future, and just cry out to you that we need you. We need you to act on our behalf. And Lord, we shouldn't tell you how to do it, but just ask you to do it. In faith, believing that you can and that you are willing. So I pray for these, my brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord God, that each of us would examine our own hearts and look for those areas where we don't have peace. Not, not, to, not to be condemned by the fact that there's not peace there, but to see it as an opportunity to grow closer to you, to have victory in areas that maybe we've been struggling with for a long time. And we'll just trust you, that you will bring us through to the other side, and the other side is glorious. And we'll trust you you will keep us in perfect peace. A peace that will be the conduit through which your power will flow into this world. Lord, we only need to trust you when we are weak, when we are helpless, when we are blind. And as Paul said, that when he was weak, then you are strong. And that's what you want to do in us, Lord. But to do that, we have to trust you. And Lord, just as the disciples prayed and asked you, Lord, 
increase our faith that we would believe that you can be trusted in absolutely everything in our lives. So we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord God, that you will help us to trust you. Lord, even that is a gift from you. And I pray, Lord, that as we do that, Lord, the whole world will see that there is a God in heaven who loves and is worthy of trust. Thank you for these, your people. I lift up everyone here. And I lift up, Lord, if there's anyone here or anyone watching online who has never, never opened their heart to you, never trusted you from the very beginning, that they would do that right this very moment. I know there may be some, even some here right now, who have, have believed that they've put, their, they've put their trust in you, but never actually have. For whatever reason, they've been, they've been coming, they've been watching, they've been engaging, but, but never really placing all of their trust in you. I pray that today would be the day they would open up their heart and believe that Jesus, you died for their sins. And by dying for their sins, you made a way for them to be forgiven of those sins. And if they'll receive that forgiveness, then the word promises that we have eternal life with you in heaven. And so I pray that they would do that right this very moment. And for all of us, Lord, and whatever, whatever struggles we're going through, whatever difficult things, whatever impossible things, whatever things that we need to trust you in, I pray, Lord, that you would comfort us in those places where we need comfort, strength, where we need strengthening. Lord, wisdom, Lord, whatever it is that we need, I pray, Lord, you give us those things and give them to us abundantly as your word had promised us that you will give us freely all things. Lord, and we claim that promise and we claim it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you all. Please, if we can pray with you, let us pray with you. Otherwise, go trust God this week. Amen? Amen. <laughs>